baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. In a few minutes this morning, we've been in Nehemiah since the first of the year, basically on Sunday mornings. And the book of Nehemiah is not just about rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, which any historian worth their salt, they'll tell you that, that it's about that. But it's about much more, because really what Nehemiah is about is he's about rebuilding a future for God's people. He's about um, not just building walls and gates and getting a city back in, in function. He's about building a future home for the people of God. And we've mentioned it, but just for perspective, uh, if you're joining us uh, this morning, Jerusalem had been vacated by uh, the Israelites wholesale. They had gone into captivity. Uh, They had come back several years. In fact, about 14 decades prior to Nehemiah arriving in town, they had come back and they tried. They put a lot of effort and a lot of money and a lot of time into it, but uh, they just didn't have uh, that leader that had the word from God for them. And Jerusalem, 14 decades later, still kind of looks like New Orleans after Katrina. It's just devastation everywhere. And the people are scattered, they're demoralized, and then it just turns. And in 52 days, this man of God organizes 42 different working parties, and uh, they restore a 50-foot high wall with a circumference of four miles around uh, at a rate of about 504 feet feet per day. And, And they do it all... Uh, while they're fighting severe opposition. It's, it's really a miracle. And the reason they were able to accomplish in only 52 days what nobody else had been able to accomplish in, in 140 years was because God worked with them. They prayed, but when they got done praying, they acted. And you know what? Depending on our nature, we kind of, in our spiritual lives, we gravitate to one place or the other. Uh, Pastor Jack mentioned Mary and, and Martha, I think, last night in prayer service. You know, we, we did the Martha thing yesterday morning. We all got here and we all picked up paintbrushes and utility knives and hammers and, and mops and brooms and shovels and whatever. And we did that kind of work. And that's very important because the church doesn't survive without that kind of work. But then last night we gathered together and uh, we had prayer meeting. And that's the Mary kind of work. Uh, sitting at the feet of Jesus and God speaking to us. And so these people had that. They prayed and they acted. They did both. And that's why God worked with them. Now, Nehemiah, he had uh, three enemies in his quest to rebuild Jerusalem. And we've talked about these guys before. They are um, um, kind of uh, the, the, the opposition in a major part to uh, Nehemiah. And the first one is Sanballat. Everyone say Sanballat. Sanballat is... Um, his name means hatred in secret. Sanballat is the guy that um, he represents the devil. And his idea about these walls is um, that they're not necessary. You don't need walls for this city. Uh, and that's Sanballat. Sanballat gives them a problem that way. Um, then there's Tobiah. Everyone say Tobiah. Tobiah represents the, the flesh. And his uh, name actually means Jehovah is Good, which is a strange name for somebody that's opposing the people of Jehovah, but that's exactly what he does. And uh, Tobiah, his name means Jehovah is good, and he represents the flesh. And your flesh can do some good things. Your uh, flesh can have some, some good ideas and some good motivations sometimes, but how many know that the flesh can also give us a problem sometimes? And so that's Tobiah. Boy, that was a great little murmur of, yeah, 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 we know. Uh, we got that one down, don't we? We don't need a pastor to tell us that. Uh, and then there's Geshem. And Geshem is uh, the third enemy, and his name means uh, corporeal or having material substance. And he represents the world around us, which has material substance. But do you know the world around us isn't the most real thing? God is the most real thing. And uh, so he represents the world. So you've got these three enemies, the devil, the flesh, and the world. And uh, Sanballat, he represents the devil. He says these walls aren't necessary. And Tobiah, he represents the flesh. And he says that the walls, you know, this is just too much work. 
And uh, I don't know if you've ever felt like that. I think most people that have served God and attended church and been faithful for any length of time, at some point the devil comes and whispers to you, you know, this is really a lot of work. And you know what? To do anything profitable in life is a lot of work. Um, nobody just kind of stumbles into um, great wealth or great influence or great whatever in the world. Even worldly things take a lot of work. You say, I know somebody whose rich Uncle Charlie died. Well, rich Uncle Charlie worked for that money. Somebody worked for that. It, stuff doesn't just happen by accident. And, and so much less in the kingdom of God where we're fighting these enemies. And Geshem, his, his name, uh, he represents the world. And the world's attitude is, you know what, when you build walls and when you, you know, live a certain lifestyle and when you give yourself to this God and, and, and you believe that this is truth and there is truth and there's stuff that's not true, which is just logic, by the way, uh, the world would tell us that that's intolerant. And we see it everywhere. Everywhere the world says, well, that's intolerant to believe that Jesus is the only way. And that's intolerant to believe that the Bible is the word of God. And that's intolerant to believe that, you know, your uh, religion is right and other religions somewhere in the world are wrong. That's intolerant. And that is totally and constantly the message of the world. And so we've been kind of hunkering down in the first few chapters of Nehemiah. And I want to take you over and land in chapter six today because uh, by the time we get to chapter 6, the wall is uh, completely finished. It's, it's basically all done except for the gates. They've still got to put the gates on the wall, but the wall is basically back in shape. And this is an amazing feat because they've accomplished this work while literally surrounded by enemies. Uh, to the north, Sanballat and the Samaritans. To the east, Tobiah and the Ammonites. To the south, Geshem and the Arabs. And to the west, the Ashdodites. And Ashdod is the capital of Philistia, the Philistines. And they don't want a city here. So they, they've got four different enemies and they're surrounded like the points of a compass. And it's at this point, when they get the walls looking like this instead of a pile of rubble, it's at this point that the enemy changes his tactics totally. And uh, up, up until the point that the walls are built, the enemy has opposed the building of the walls. He's fought. He has opposed and opposed and opposed the building of the walls. And now that he sees that the walls are built and the city is at least established, he changes his tactic. And now the enemy offers, out of the goodness of his heart, to cooperate with the people of God. And here's where we pick it up. Nehemiah chapter 6, uh, verse 1. Now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates. That's still left to be done. That Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Oh no. Everyone say, Oh no. Yeah, because it wasn't a good idea. Uh, but it's not named that way. I don't know why it's named that way. There's weird names in the Bible. Um, but they thought to do me mischief, and I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work. Now, the work wasn't great because Nehemiah had some uh, megalomaniac uh, ego complex. That's not why the work's great. The work's great because it's the work of God. And so Nehemiah says, I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease? Why should I stop serving God? Why should I stop doing what God's called me to do while I leave it and come down to you? Yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. Nehemiah said, it doesn't matter how many times you call to me and say, come on down, come on over here, come on and meet, come on and, and, and negotiate with us. It doesn't matter. I am up here on this wall, slinging a hammer, doing this. I'm getting ready to hang the gates. Uh, I'm getting ready to set up the doors of the city. We are doing a great work. And it doesn't matter how many distractions there are from the enemy. We are not coming down to converse, to compromise, to negotiate, to cooperate. Because you know what? We're real happy working for God. And we're just excited about what God's doing. And it reminds me of the Apostle Paul in the New Testament who said this. He said, neither give place to the devil. Very concise scripture. Um, if you've ever had a telemarketer call you, anybody ever have that experience? Or you've ever had a salesman come to your door and, and they may not have physically done this, but you feel like They've got their foot in your door, just kind of like keeping it open. They just keep talking and you say, really not interested. And have you ever noticed they've practiced like five different lines when you say not interested? Uh, they, they have a way of making you feel guilty that you're not interested. They're, they're pros. And, and you know, um, it, it, it's really kind of um, an imposition, but we try to be polite 
And Paul's basically saying in this Scripture, don't be polite to the enemy. Don't give place to the devil. This literally means in the Greek language, don't even give a toehold. Don't even give a foothold. Don't let the devil have even one little inch of ground to set his foot on the beach of your life and establish a beachhead in the war that he's waging against you. Don't give place to him. Because if you give place, the devil won't just take a foothold. The devil will take a lot of space before he's done. Now, as the leader, Nehemiah does the right thing. He draws a line in the sand and he says, um, we have nothing in common with you, Sanballat. We have nothing in common with you and your crowd. And there can be no basis of cooperation. And, and this isn't the first time Nehemiah said this. And, and th- this is the whole, you know, the devil keeps coming back over and over and over and over trying to close this deal. Because it was way back in chapter 2 that Nehemiah said this, He said, I answered Sanballat and and Geshem and Tobiah. I answered them and I said, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we as servants will arise and build. But ye, you have no portion, you have no right, you have no memorial in Jerusalem. Now, uh, the Bible tells us very specifically and very plainly that the, the enemies we fight against are not flesh and blood. Uh, I, I know from time to time I've, I've heard about pastors that they get into some little tussle with their city council over zoning when they were trying to build something or whatever. But you know what? City council is not our enemy. The provincial government is not our enemy. The federal government is not our enemy. Uh, the, the immoral uh, factors in our world system, that's not our enemy. Uh, the school system or Hollywood or uh, Wall Street, that's not our enemy. Our enemies are not flesh and blood enemies. Our enemies are spiritual Forces that are arrayed against us in trying to serve God. And so Nehemiah said, you know what? We don't make any compromise or any cooperation with you. Uh, Spiritual forces that are arrayed against the church, we just push them out and push them away. And this is not an Old Testament concept. In in fact, a lot of people have this kind of uh, false idea that, well, the Old Testament of the Bible, uh, the part that was dealing with the Jews and Israel, and they had battles, and God says, stamp out your enemies and, and don't have anything to do with them. You know, that's the strict part of the Bible. But when we get to the New Testament, uh, that's the day of grace. And that's the day when God's, you know, offering forgiveness. And so the New Testament is kind of where we get off easy and where we get off light and God forgives and He's our big buddy in the sky. And, and, you know, He wouldn't do anything to hurt us and He loves us just the way we are and, and whatever. And they've got that false idea. And that's exactly opposite of the way it really is. A couple of examples come to mind. In the Old Testament, the Bible says, uh, Thou shalt not kill. That's a commandment. It's one of the Ten Commandments. You know what the New Testament says? The easy time? The easy place? It says, If you hate your brother without a cause... If you hate your brother in your heart, if you harbor secret animosity and resentment toward your brother, it's as if you killed him. So you're not only responsible in the New Testament for your actions, you're responsible for your attitudes. Ooh. Now, which is a higher law to come up to? Old Testament law or New Testament grace? And in the Old Testament, here's another example. The Old Testament says don't commit adultery. Don't physically go and commit a sexual sin outside of marriage. Don't physically commit adultery. In the New Testament it says, if you look on someone to lust after them, you've already committed adultery with them in your heart. You don't have to go to the bedroom. You've already committed adultery in your heart. Now, which is a higher law to measure up to? Old Testament law or New Testament grace? The the dispensation of grace, the New Testament, doesn't let us off easy. In fact, the laws are stricter. They're more to deal with our internal spirit, so we can't fake God out. God really knows. He really looks. He really cares what's going on in your heart. And that's the New Testament. And so I don't know if this happens to you, but it happens to me every once in a while. I think, like, good gravy. Who in the world can measure up to that? It was hard enough in the Old Testament. You know what? One word that would sum up the whole Old Testament is the word failure. 
God gave them the law, they broke the law. God gave them a city, told them to keep it, they lost it. God uh, gives them festivals, says don't dishonor them, they dishonor them all the time. God says, keep your sacrifices holy, they bring all this cheap stuff to God and offer it. They totally mess up and fail under Old Testament. So God says, okay, New Testament, let's jack the laws up ten times. How in the world do you do that? Only one way. That in the New Testament, God doesn't leave us in a physical city with a In the New Testament, God says, I am going to live within you. I am going to put my spirit in you. I'm not going to write my laws on tables of stone. I'm going to write my laws on the fleshly tables of your heart. That's New Testament. And then he says, I'm going to not only be with you, I'm going to be in you. There's this running debate in theological circles today. I don't know if you've heard it or not. You know, well, you don't need to have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You know, if you do, it's wonderful, it's nice, it's a blessing from God. And some people get it, but you know what? If you don't get it, it's no big deal. I beg to differ. I can't serve God without the power of the Holy Ghost in my life. I can't keep the laws of God without the power of the Holy Ghost trying to help me govern my actions. I have enough problems with the Holy Ghost in my life. I wouldn't want to try to live for God without the Holy Ghost. And so without picking a fight with anybody else, I just look at them and think, idiot. What in the world do you think? Say, I don't need God. God offers the baptism of His Spirit to us. And, and it's like, why wouldn't you want it? Who in their right mind wouldn't want that? We need it. And so the real issue is not, do I have to? The real issue is, I get to. That's the real issue. Because in the New Testament, folks, it's very much like the book of Nehemiah. Where there's no compromise with the enemy, where the walls are built tall and they're built thick and they're built strong. And and in case you think the New Testament is just kind of letting us all off the hook, take a look at this from the pen of the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? They don't mix. And what communion has light with darkness? They don't mix. And what concord, what unity hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? There's very few times in the New Testament that Paul just hammers off four or five comparisons like that to emphasize a point. And he says this, For you, believer, you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and I will walk in them and I will be their God and they'll be my people And then Paul gives us a wherefore. Everyone say wherefore. When you see wherefore or therefore, you need to ask what it's there for. And here's why it's there. On the basis of all of that, that God will not, cannot bring himself to fellowship with darkness or sin or the the powers of the enemy in a life. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye what? That's a word nobody likes anymore. But it's an incredibly critical word if you're going to serve God. Because the Bible says things like this. The Bible dares to tell us, be ye holy, says God, for I am holy. The Bible dares to say, without holiness, no man shall see God. You know what holiness means? Synonym. Holiness means separation. Without being separated from the spiritual forces and the habits and the lifestyles that are in the world, you can't be saved anyway. Salvation or holiness means Separation. God has always wanted a people that were peculiar. In the Old Testament, He called them peculiar. Guess what He calls us in the New Testament? Peculiar. Look at your neighbor and say, you're peculiar. And you can really mean it. It's a theological term. Come on, help me out here. Look at your neighbor and say, you're peculiar. If somebody's not cooperating... Oh, never mind. Never mind. Wherefore, come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and then... I'll receive you, and I'll be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, 
Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh, outward life, and spirit, inward life, perfecting holiness or separation in the fear of God. Now, when pastors talk about this stuff, everybody kind of goes... And the reason they do is it makes them nervous because like, Pastor, if we talk about being separated from the world, then we're not going to make people that love the world very comfortable. Precisely. Because what we really need in wanting to serve God is not people that are have an affinity with the world, have a friendship with the world. The Bible says friendship with the world is enmity with God. What we really need are people that are sick of the world. What we really need are people that are sick of the same old, same old, and sick of the same old addiction, and sick of the same old drugs. They're not trying to hide it so they can come to church and look religious. They're trying to get rid of it. They, they don't want that. They know what destruction that's brought into their life. And so that's really what we're after. And that's why Paul, he's so direct. And, and see, I, I have to tell you this, that God's people are different. And we say different. We are different than any other group of people in the world. And we maintain this separation from the world because of God's Spirit that's in us. He pulls us away from the world so He can pull us close to Himself. And Nehemiah refused the chance for repeated offers. If the offer to compromise with the enemy was wrong the first time, it was wrong the fourth time. And it would be wrong the fortieth time. You see, decisions just based on somebody's opinion, you can reconsider those. Those those aren't a big deal. But decisions based on a conviction, you need to hang on to those. And some think that, you know, well, it's, it's kind of like this, Pastor Raymond. You know, we've been watching the church. Uh, we've been watching even your local church. We've been watching, you know, ministry over the years and saints over the years. And, and you know what we've observed is that methods have changed. Well, thank God for that, because I didn't see any Model T's in the parking lot. No donkeys either. No horse-drawn carts, no wagons. You know, I, I didn't see any of that in the parking lot. So methods have changed. And methods have changed in the way we do church. Uh, thank God for technology. Thank God that uh, today we're connecting with people over the Internet and our services. Uh, there's people in different parts. Of, can you imagine a little church in Fredericton, New Brunswick? There are people in different parts of the world watching our services today. And uh, talked to one of them yesterday from a far distant country around the planet. It's probably 40 hours of flying to get there. I don't know. And, and he's been impacted by our church services. And I'm so thankful for that. So methods have changed. That's incredible. But, the, but, but, but here's the point. Do you know why he's impacted by our services? It's because our message has not changed. Because in a world when you can log on to any kind of religious website and watch any kind of service in churches that are 20 times bigger than this one, uh, you, you can do anything online. You can watch any kind of religion. You know why the move of God's Spirit in our midst has, has made a difference in that life and in other lives and it's made a difference in our lives? It's because the message that this church was founded on, which is a biblical message, it's never changed. There's still a God who wants to pull you out of the sinful world for your own good, set your feet on a rock, change you from the inside out, get you ready for His heaven, and enable you to do it all through the power of the Holy Ghost that lives in you. And we need that power like we've never needed it before. We don't need less power in this world because it's more modern or postmodern or whatever term you want to put on it. We need more of the power of God in this time than we ever have before. So when the enemy's, uh, when his little overtures for compromise failed, um, he tries this. He tries the tactic of slander against Nehemiah. Uh, Sam, Ballot, and Tobiah and Geshep, they actually get together and they send this letter off to the king complaining about Nehemiah and slandering him. And, and you know what? Um, church people, Christians, and pastors in particular, you know, you just need to develop this, this little iron skin and a good cast iron backbone and just say, you know what, it doesn't matter what people say. Some of you face opposition at work. Some of you face people at work that they... Has anybody found that sometimes your worst opposition to you living wholeheartedly for God is kind of like lukewarm Christians? Anybody found that? You know, people that, you know, they it's not all that necessary... They are your worst opposition because you think they're on your team. They're not on your team. 
They're caught somewhere in la la land between the world and the church. They don't know whatever way the wind blows. That's where they are. You know, if it's more popular to belong to the world on Tuesday, they're there. And if it's more popular to be a Christian on Sunday, they're there. But they're, they just really swing back and forth. They're your worst opposition. They, they, they say things that are absolutely ridiculous. It's not necessary to do all that praying and all that worshiping and all that noise and all that blah, 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 blah. They don't have a clue what they're talking about. With so many commands in the Bible to live for God with abandon and worship God with exuberance and come into His presence with singing and dancing and leaping and shouting and clapping. Who in their right mind could sit like a bump on a log when the presence of God is moving? You need to give yourself with abandon to God. And so, Nehemiah, he faces that. They, they write all of these letters. And, and he just learned how to handle false accusations and vicious letters and gossip and all kinds of stuff. Because other than that, those devilish weapons will make Christian leaders or Christian people lose their perspective. We are doing a great work and we cannot take time to come down and talk with you. We're sold out to God. I'm not talking about an arrogant spirit that doesn't speak to anybody. That's not even what we're talking about. I'm talking about throwing yourself into the work of God as a member of a local church, as a child of God, as a saint of the Most High God. Just throw yourself into the work of God and just refuse to listen to all the chatter of the enemies roundabout. Nehemiah didn't make that mistake. Uh, look, look at this. This is chapter 6. Music, come on. So the wall was finished. Everyone say finished. It was finished in the 20 and 5th day of the month, Elul, in 50 and 2 days. They, they finished it. It's done. And the enemy, he morphs again. And it came to pass when all our enemies heard thereof and all the heathen that were round about us saw these things. They were much, very much cast down in their own eyes. For they then perceived that this work was wrought of our God. It took a while to get through. It took a while to get done. It took a while to get finished. But when it was all done, nobody was sitting around saying, look what Nehemiah did. Nobody was sitting around saying, look what the 52 companies did. Nobody was sitting around saying, look what the Jews did. People were sitting around saying, God did this. God spoke. He intervened directly in the service here on Wednesday night. And He spoke to us so powerfully. And Pastor Jack read you part of that prophecy this morning. Amazing what God is doing. And when it all gets done, and by the end of this year, we're sitting in a New Year's Eve service and we're showing pictures of all of the people that have been baptized and all the services where people receive the Holy Ghost and the new families that are part of our church and the families that came in through the fireproof outreach and the young people that were touched by youth explosion and the people that got the Holy Ghost at the camp meeting that we'll host this summer and the people that, you know, they came in through a Bible study and the people that they didn't know if they could serve God, but six months later they're still here and they're in watch night on December 31st, 2009. Nobody's going to say, well, the pastors did that or the saints did that or this group did that or that ministry did that. You know what? We're all going to be sitting around saying at the end of this year, after God gives us an incredible year of harvest and ingathering, we're going to be sitting around saying, look what God did this year. And so we got it, right? Period. End of story. No, well, no. Chapter 6 isn't the end of Nehemiah. In fact, the wall's finished, but that only marks a, a new stage in spiritual warfare because now Nehemiah has to protect what has been established. Let me talk to you. Five minutes back. The devil wants to tear down what God has established in your life. And he never rests. He never stops. Look at this scripture. This is from the temptation of Jesus in the New Testament. Luke chapter 4, verse 13. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him. Wouldn't that be nice? There's three words at the end of that verse. What's it say? For a season. Now, if you look at that verse in some of the modern translations of Scripture, here's the message. This completed the testing. The devil retreated. Everyone say retreated. Have you ever felt like you walk out of a service about this high off the ground and you gave the devil a real bad whooping? <laughs> he doesn't stay away for very long, does he? He's the toughest old crustacean I've ever met. I've met some of his relatives, but he's the toughest.
<laughs> You've heard about the guy that the devil kept giving him a hard time. He said, look, you might as well leave me alone. I married your sister. <laughs> this completed the test. Back to the Word of God real quick. Speaking of retreat. The devil retreated. He retreated. Temporarily. Lying in wait. What? For another opportunity. Some of you new believers, don't get distressed when you think, oh, I did good for three days and that, like, mm, here comes the devil again. That's exactly what he did to Jesus. God manifest in flesh. That's exactly what he did to all the first century church members. That's exactly what he does to all the seasoned saints that you see them coming in here and you think they've got angel wings. And they don't. And neither does the pastor. The devil, he waits temporarily. He's always looking for another opportunity. Here's the Amplified uh, Bible. It, it adds different shades of meaning of the Greek language to help us understand. And when the devil had ended every temptation, or when he had ended the cycle of temptation for that time, he temporarily left him. That is, he stood off from him. He, just, he was still there. He was still watching. He just stood away. Until another more opportune and favorable time. That's what the devil does with us. And that almost happened to the people of Jerusalem in Nehemiah's time. Because the next several chapters of the book, chapter 7, 8, 9, you know, it goes on. And they're, they're doing a good job protecting. And then Nehemiah, he goes back, takes a journey back to the king. And he reports back to the king what's happening. While he's gone, Tobiah, the flesh, he acts up and... You know, you've always got to guard against replacing Nehemiah that represents godly leadership with your own desires of the flesh in your life. And so, if you fast forward all the way to the last chapter of Nehemiah, here's the scripture I'd like to share with you as we close this morning. And before this, Eliashib the priest, so this is a religious leader, should know better, Having the oversight of the chamber of the house of our God, he was allied unto Dubai. He made a deal with the flesh. He made a, a covenant with the flesh. And he had prepared for him a great chamber where aforetime they had laid the meat offerings, the frankincense, the vessels, the tithes of the corn, the new wine, the oil, which was commanded to be given to the Levites and the singers, the porters, and the, not Annette and Eric, but the other porters that carry stuff, and the offerings of the priests. So this priest who should know better and should do different, he makes this deal with Tobiah, who represents the flesh. And you know what he does? He clears out a big room in the temple itself where they're supposed to store all of the stuff that they bring, all the offerings they bring for the work of God. He pulls them all out and lets Tobiah move in and bring all of his junk. And Nehemiah says, but in all this time was not I at Jerusalem for in the two and thirtieth year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I came unto the king, and after certain days obtained I leave of the king. So here, here's the end of the story, punchline. And Nehemiah comes back to Jerusalem. He said, I understood the evil that Eliashib the priest did for Tobiah in preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And it grieved me sore, like this. Therefore I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. Nehemiah just wades in and he takes all of the stuff of Tobiah and he just starts heaving it out in the street. He makes no deal with the flesh. Jesus told this parable in the book of Luke and he said this, that a nobleman went away to a far country. He's drawing a comparison to himself. And he said that as he went to go get his kingdom, he called his servants. Everyone say servants. We're God's servants. And he said, while I'm gone, while I'm away, occupy till I come back. Occupy doesn't just mean fill up space. Occupy doesn't mean sit on a church pew. Occupy doesn't mean show up to religious services. Occupy is the same battle word that we've used all around the world in the last few years. We've got occupying forces in Afghanistan. And we've got occupying forces in Iraq. And we've got occupying forces in many different hot spots of the world. We've got an occupation that's been going on kind of tenuously in Gaza with the Israelis and, and, and the Arabs. We've got all of that stuff going on. Those occupying forces aren't just sitting back on the beach getting a suntan. Those occupying 
occupying forces are carrying out the orders of their commander, he's back in the command center. He's back at home. He's given direction. He's in the big tent that's well protected, and he's given orders. You know what occupying forces do? They carry out the directives. You know why we're here? You know why God's left us here in 2009? Is to carry out the standing orders that the Lord gave us. He gave them to us about 2,000 years ago. Go into all the world and preach it to every nation. Teach people. Make disciples of them. Baptize them. Take this message everywhere. We're still doing that. Our orders haven't changed. And what Tobiah will do, the flesh will do. In your own life, he'll try to set up right in the middle. Oh, the walls are established. Let's just make a deal. Just let me kind of come in and I'll just set up this little room. I won't take over the whole city. I'll just set up this little room. And if you let the flesh make that kind of deal with you, you actually defeat all the work that you and God have done in your life. How many appreciate being able to work with God on yourself over the last several years? You see, that's God's Spirit working in you. So now we have to be careful that the flesh doesn't creep in. Because the flesh will get in. Doesn't want the whole city? Just a room. Give me a little room. And it colors everything that God's done. You notice little attitudes creeping back in. You notice little desires creeping back in. And so you need to develop in your spirit what Nehemiah had in his spirit. And any time the flesh steps in, any time the flesh tries to re-exert itself and re-emphasize itself and re-dominate. Anytime that happens, you need to develop the spirit of Nehemiah and just wade into your own life and just pitch all of that stuff out in the street. No mercy. No mercy. It seems a funny place to close the book of Nehemiah, i got to tell you. If Nehemiah had been writing this as a tribute to himself, he would have closed at the building of the walls. The finishing of the city. He wouldn't have given us this little PS, but God wanted to warn us of something. That the devil sees every victory that you win as just a temporary setback for him. So he's always on the lookout to gain a foothold. Paul said, neither give place to the devil. I don't know what area that directs itself to in your life. I don't know what that means to you. I just know it's very, very important. Can I get you to lift your hands right now and just close your eyes and let God cement His Word into your heart. Somebody you're struggling with, well, why? Why does God demand that? Or why does God ask for that? Or why does God want me to do that? And the answer is God's building His kingdom in your life. The flesh would like to get in. Just one little corner. I'll do everything else, God, but not that one. I'll, I'll, I'll obey everything else, but not that. That's my little corner. That's my little room. That's where I've let something come in and just set up camp. And It's so important that we give that back to God. Would you stand with me right now in the house of God? I'm not sure how we're going to do this, so we need to just pray one more time. But I'm going to ask you at least to make this decision in your life that I'm going to give that room, that corner, that area, I'm going to give it to God this morning. Can I get you one more time, Church of the Living God, to just lift up your hands in God's presence. Just lift up your hands. You say, God won a great victory in my life. Yes, He did. God's built a great thing in my life. Yes, He has. I'm so amazed at what God has done. That's incredible. But God would like to just warn you, give you a little P.S. to the story and say, be careful that your own flesh doesn't creep back in and say, well, it's time to relax. It's time to just sit back. It's time to just not be too careful. Everything's good. As soon as you do that, He starts to have influence. So God's really asking you this morning, could you give me that one last little room, that one last little area where you've said in your own mind, I don't think I can ever give that up. I don't think I can ever do that. I don't think I can ever make that uh, a deal with God. God's asking for that this morning. He's exactly that bold. Lord Jesus, I thank You for Your Word. Thank You for how honest it is. Thank You for how direct it is. God, I even thank You for the times it makes us a little uncomfortable. Because God, Your purpose for us is not just to have us be religious people who have our act together and we fake everybody out. But Your purpose for us is to really do a work from the inside out. I thank You, God, for the strength of the passage that we read from this morning. 
I thank you for Nehemiah's example. And I thank you for the honesty that he showed in writing this book under the inspiration of your spirit. Now, Lord God, I'm praying for some person in here that you have done a great work in their life. But the devil, he's been standing back watching for an opportunity. And he thinks he has it. He thinks he's got that one little room where they've reserved that for them. He thinks he's got that one little area where they've kind of put up the, the guard and they've said, this is my little area in my life. And I pray for that person this morning that they will have the courage and the strength to make the decision not to give 98% of their life to you, but to give 100% of their life to you. Lord, God, help me bear down on this right now with your spirit. Because, God, for somebody, this is a decision that literally will impact the quality of their life for you for the rest of their life. For somebody, this is a destiny-altering decision because what they've held back on is actually a life choice. It's a life course. It's a decision that impacts every day of their future. And God, the enemy's so cruel, he's seeking for an advantage. And so I pray for that person this morning. They are not the majority here today, but they are here. I pray for them today that they will have the strength They will have the courage. They will have the spirit of just abandoning it all to you to make the decision and make the choice today. Today. In Jesus' name. Church, can I get you to worship God for a moment? Pastor just needs to end this service right. That's good. I just need your help. If you need to slip out, that's fine. We're not trying to hold you, but for the rest of you, if you could just kind of worship God. So pare de la queso salva. Teramoso salva de la bolo cotesa. I worship you, God. I worship you, God. Now, if this great church would just continue to worship and Pastor really does need you right now, I need you to just close your eyes and just worship. With abandon, just worship. Just worship. Because in a climate like that, spiritual strength is created. (coughs) Now, I'm calling for somebody. You love God. God's done such a great thing. He's built His kingdom in your life. And you've been right there for the whole thing. And there's just one little room. And you know exactly what Pastor's talking about this morning. Because it just kept coming forcibly to your mind. All through this message from the moment we mentioned it. And so I want you to make that decision this morning. You're not going to be alone. There's other people who have to make a very similar decision. Maybe about a totally different area. But as this great church just worships God, I'm going to ask you, thank you. I'm going to ask you to take a step and just walk to the front and say, God, I give it all to you. I've given you 98%, 99%, but, but you know what? That's just not going to do. I give you 100%. I give you that, that, that little area. God, you and I know what it is. God, you and I know what it is. I've given you everything else, but I give you this one to- saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world.
Baptism is done to wash away our sins. Acts 22.16 Baptism is done to be reborn to new life. John 3.5 Romans 6.3-6 Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ. Galatians 3.26-27 and 27. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings unto the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow, become a servant of righteousness, keep self pure, be an example, have faith in God, follow Jesus, put first things first, resist temptation, be faithful, and be fruitful.